Despite Churchill's best efforts in World War II, the Labour Party took power just before the end of the war. This meant significant changes to the way the underground was run. The government wanted to nationalise many key industries with transport facilities as a main target. After the war, in 1948, the UK railway industry saw its biggest change in its history. The big four railways were amalgamated under the British Transport Commission to become British Railways. The London Underground would still be under the Commission, but separate from British Rail, with the London Transport Executive that would replace the LPTB. After serving the London Underground for many years, Lord Ashfield had also decided that 1948 was his time to move on as well. He announced his retirement to the shocked board and left the Underground to be chairman of the British Transport Commission. Lord Ashfield was the very last link that the Underground was left to its mixed past. Lord Ashfield and Frank Pick brought an unmatched quality and design to a failing network and not only brought it together, but excelled in making it one of the most successful and famous transport networks in the world. Lord Ashfield's tenure as chairman was sadly short-lived, as when after eight months after he joined, he sadly passed away. Lord Latham took the reins of the Transport Commission where Ashfield had left off. Latham was not a patch on Ashfield and had limited knowledge of running a railway. His tenure did not start well. The government, keen to get the country back on track, funded several projects, focusing on rebuilding and infrastructure. The underground, expecting the significant cut, were disappointed to get much less than anticipated, especially due to the contributions the tube made to the war effort. Instead, the government grants only facilitated the finishing of extensions of the central lines. All new work was suspended or axed completely, especially with Greenbelt plans brought, over, brought in to stop over urbanisation. Even though the underground was forced to axe many extensions and new projects, they were allowed to revamp many key stations and give them a much needed facelift. Inspired by French influences, Lofton Station, Gants Hill, Anger Lane, Perry Vale and White City all received new stations. The elaborate dated decorations were replaced with modern clean interiors, cream interior paint and open plan station halls. Within five years the underground had managed to claw back enough investment to start changing the rolling stock on the district and circle lines. Thanks to the factories the underground hosted, the experience obtained for building the bombers allowed for the provision of new carriages. The Type R stock were delivered. The decrease in the supply of steel caused the new engines to be made of aluminium alloy. The new alloy had several unexpected bonuses. It was resistant to rust and corrosion, was lighter than previous carriages and more fuel efficient and the unpainted carriages were unexpectedly popular with the passengers and saving the railway over a quarter of a tonne of paint per carriage. In time, all trains would be steadily changed from the steel to the new alloy. The new carriages were introduced to the railway in 1953. A mildly decorated interior pleased the passengers and new fluorescent lighting would replace the tungsten lamps for the first time. The new lighting not only saved energy, but were brighter. The Metropolitan Line would also receive new stock as well. The trains had not been updated since before the war and the teak carriages were beginning to look dated and old. The replacements would only be described as strange. The new tea stock had seating in a centre island arrangement instead of having seating near the windows. Because of the unusual arrangement of the seating, the seated passengers would be flanked either side by standing passengers and the doors would open onto the seating passengers, giving them an icy chill from the outside temperatures. To suffice to say, these new carriages only lasted three years before the grumbles and complaints of the passengers forced the London Transport Executive to change the layout of the carriages to something much more conventional. In 1951, 100 brand new trains were delivered known as the 1951 stock. The new stock were of the design of Graf Baker. 
Following feedback, Baker extended the window profile onto the carriage roof. This allowed for standing passengers to see outside and ensure they didn't miss their station. And new circular windows near the door frame was an unusual touch. The interior was vastly improved, but the underground was to suffer a further setback. Graf Baker passed away suddenly on his way to work, pushing back development of further carriages. The pressure of the other outdated stock caused the underground to have yet another facelift on the carriages. Because of Graf Baker's sudden passing, the London Transport Executive went literally back to the drawing board and brushed off all plans for the 1938. The stock was identical, save for the lack of paint and the new aluminium body. It filled the gaps and allowed developers to produce three new prototype trains known as the 1956 SOC. The new trains paved the way for the new 1959 and 62 stock. So we've moved onwards another decade, and as we leave the rock and roll 50s, we head to the swinging 60s and 70s. So tune in next time as we look more closely at new stock developments and the new developments to the Victoria line that nearly brought the whole underground system to its knees.